Hey everybody, on this episode of I Talk Movies, we're getting up close and personal with writer and directors Jeff Chan and Andrew Reimer. Let's do it. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, here's Popcorn Talk's I Talk Movies. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of I Talk Movies. This is the show where we get up close and personal with the people both in front and behind the camera that bring you the latest films that you can see in the theater, at home, or on a mobile streaming device. I'm Frank Moran. My guests today are a writing and directing team who met at NYU and are a great example of never giving up on a project that you believe in. Together, they've worked on shows such as the Hulu series Pen15 and a couple viral shorts which open the door to the film I'll be talking with him about today. And that is Plus One, which happened to win the Audience Award for Best Narrative Film at the Tribeca Film Festival. It opens up in theaters, digitally, and on demand, June 14th. Please welcome writers and directors, Jeff Chan and Andrew Reimer. Oh, look at the crowd goes wild. <laughs> yes. Uh, Thank you for having us. Absolutely. That was such a succinct bio of us. Oh, there I, you go. I wouldn't even be able to do that. We're much more used to walking in a room. People just going, so who are you? Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> What'd you do? What? <laughs> that was amazing. What have you done? Well, guys, all right, and that's the show, guys. That's not going to get any hey, better than that. We'll it's all going down here. <laughs> uh, so the film was incredible. So I really enjoyed it. Thank and you. I, Thank I mean, you. I'm sure that there's a lot of the... Uh, you're like, oh, I love the film. Mm. But it was it was a really <laughs> enjoyable to watch kind of experience. We're going to get more into that in just a second. But I want to talk a little bit about the two of you just as individuals before you actually met. Sure. So I was talking a little bit before we started the show. And Andrew, you grew up around here. I did. I grew up in uh, Burbank, California, uh, and uh, also in uh, Pasadena a little bit later. Uh, my dad was a screenwriter, uh, so I kind of grew up um, a- around some satellite of the business. Uh, but yeah, I literally grew up right down the street from this studio, so... Uh, back in back in the hometown now. So now was it by seeing your dad working on scripts that kind of opened, kind of piqued your interest and said this is something I'd like to do as well. It, weirdly, I don't know that it necessarily piqued my interest, but it did demystify the you know a, the. I think so many people grow up not having no idea that making a movie or writing a movie or any of those kind of things, it just doesn't really seem like an available possibility to most people and. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think that I it, I didn't grow up wanting like from age two like with a camera in my hand like knowing that I wanted to do this. But um, when I kind of came to the time in high school where like so many people do like making movies is basically hanging out with your friends on the weekend and doing something weird. You know, like that was when I really realized that like this was something I wanted to chase. Is it just by uh, growing up with your dad being a screenwriter? Just sure kind of picking up his kind of work ethic, work, work habits as you started to try to dip your toes in this? Yeah, my dad had a really um, amazing work ethic. Uh, you know, he, he had a lifestyle that, you know, I could tell from a very early age was very enviable. He was <laughs> home. He, he had an office that was in the attic of our house. Um, aside from being very hot, he seemed to really like his job. Uh, literally hot in the, in the attic because that was where he chose to work. But uh, no, he was at you know baseball practices and and was made his own schedule. And he worked really. I mean, he woke up every day at five thirty or six in the morning and started working. And then he would hit the end of his workday was always the time that the, me and my sisters were out of school and he would hang out with the family. And then you know, uh, so I think he was weird for writers. I think the stereotype of a writer is somebody that's kind of in their head. And when inspiration strikes, they're off and doing their thing. My dad was very much like, no, I want this is my job. I take this very seriously, but so is raising my family. And so that was, you know, anyway, that was what I grew up with. So <laughs> uh, yeah. now Jeff, about yourself, did you grow up like around here? Did you grow up in the East coast? I grew up in New Jersey. Yeah. A okay. suburb in New Jersey. My dad worked in Chinatown. And so we had a house about 30 minutes outside the city. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I got my first DV camera when I was, I think 15 years old and I started filming random stuff that I was seeing, like tree, <laughs> like leaves falling from trees and rushing water, and I would cut it to techno music, and that's sort of how I, I just taught myself. Uh, and I was more of a computer nerd than I was a, a film nerd. I mean, I loved movies, but I loved technology, and, and to be able to cut footage together was what felt like an, the next extension of that. And it wasn't until I got to high school when I, I made friends with all the theater kids and started doing theater that I, I became really interested in telling stories and so with those those guys in in high school we would take my technical skills of being able to film and edit and you know do these really really weird out, <laughs> yeah. out there short films uh that i now in retrospect i'm like they, those were pretty avant-garde i mean we were <laughs> we were doing something we were opening doors but um 
Yeah, that's how I got into it. When yeah. was the last time you ever watched one of those? Pretty recently. Um, They're awesome. Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> they are, uh, I mean, they're they're crazy. Uh, my favorite one is called Bob, question mark, exclamation point. And the story is, it starts with, I cannot believe I'm telling this. <laughs> I'm giving a synopsis of Bob on camera right now. This, it, it's a crew of guys planning a heist. And one person's missing, and they're like, yeah, Bob's supposed to be driving the van. <laughs> and another character goes, yeah, where's Bob? The second he says, where's Bob, you hear the uh, music of uh, the song Let the Bodies Hit the Floor. Uh, I don't remember who's it, who it's by. Uh, and then there, it cuts to black and white like snuff footage of this guy with a trench coat and long hair coming in and to a dank basement killing all the guys at, a, at the table and then they all wake up suddenly in some random environment like a grocery store and they go through it again and they're like oh wow where, where are we a grocery store hey where's bob and it goes and it does this for 18 minutes you have a scene in a random place the characters wake up with amnesia someone says where's bob and then this i think this is your next place. feature i think this is i think this we needs th to be we thought it was back. the funniest thing we'd ever seen and then there was a open mic festival at our high school, and all these bands played, and then we played Where's Bob? And so you have to imagine all these high school kids like sitting there cheering for their favorite high school bands, and then Where's Bob playing, and the 18 That movie minutes. is a weird form of punishment. It is. It, it is was like, the <laughs> hardest I've ever laughed in my entire life. I remember being your, like, being freshman roommates with your with you and Matt, and Matt, you guys making me sit down and watch that for the first time, and I was like, what? It, these guys, I like, like these guys. I think they're cool. But what, what is this movie they're making me watch? It's a relentless ex social experiment. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so that's one such example of while he was learning the trade of screenwriting, I was making. Where's Bob? Now you did mention one thing when you first got the camera in. You kind of taught yourself stuff. Uh, how do you think it is compared to when you're 15 to how it is somebody that's 15 now in terms of the resources available to somebody? Oh, my God. I mean, first of all, we were the last class at NYU who shot on film and edited on Steambex. We were cutting literally with celluloid. And um, we, I mean, that was an incredibly valuable experience to appreciate the process of, of editing and, and you know, taking care in your product. That being said, that's just not how we make things anymore. Um, and I'm quite envious of everyone who came after <laughs> us because... It's nice to be able to review a take right after you shot something. It's nice to be able to try and edit, show your friends, go back in, re-edit, export, show again, you know, make multiple versions. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how we make stuff now. So I think it's important to learn to make stuff in that same way, you know, in that, with that same process and those same resources available to you. So I, I, I think it's amazing what people have now the type of, I mean, you could use an, your own phone to make something good. You know, people have already yep. made feature films with, with iPhones yep. and stuff. So I think it's amazing. So uh, you mentioned NYU. When it came time to decide a uh, university to go to, yeah. uh, you were out here on the West Coast. What made you decide, like, maybe as opposed to USC, I want to head east and go to NYU? Uh, I think partly just being 18 and I had grown up in Los Angeles and I think I just really wanted something different. I went, I had never, I went to New York one time with my, on like a family trip, probably in the middle of high school. And I just like the city just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like I just, it just, it was, I like, I've never been to a place where I just like got off a plane and was like this, the energy here, I like, you know, need to be here. And uh, you know, at that, I don't think as a young person, I had much of a trajectory. And then at some point, I don't, whatever that trip was from then on, I was like, I'm going to school in New York. And it was kind of like, you know, it became NYU and became film and all that kind of stuff. But I just knew that that was where I wanted to be and, and be learning. And yeah. It was the same for you, Jeff. That's I like, just didn't get into USC, <laughs> <laughs> so the choice was easy for me. I I really wanted to go to USC. Actually, I had the reverse experience right. of Andrew, where I came out here and I was like, "Wow, this is the where movies are made. You can feel the energy, and it's USC." And then you go right into making movies. Like yeah. it just seemed like a such a simple path. And um, I grew up outside of New York City, and I always had sort of a Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone 2 relationship to NYU. Not yeah. much better. <laughs> yeah, I, would get it. I could not handle it. And so I just was like, get me to L.A. And, and then probably within 
the first couple months of going to NYU, I was like, this is amazing. Like, this is so fun. This is where I belong. So I, it worked out. So now, uh, how did the two of you meet at NYU? We actually met before NYU, uh, very briefly. Uh, Jeff's friend, TJ, uh, who he was making Bob and several other short films with him, uh, moved to my town, moved to uh, over to Pasadena for right before senior year of high school and started telling Jeff about his California friends and then he needed to come out and meet them. So Jeff came out and while we were seniors, we did meet and kind of have a... Uh, up first sort of meet cute uh, of, uh, it wasn't really meet cute I was it, making a very self-aggrandizing stupid I think I was trying to make like a Blair Witch knockoff uh, at like a haunted something that I was like passing off as an insane asylum probably somewhere in like the you know mountains above Altadena or something uh, and I made Jeff play the ghost because he was like the kid from out of town that you know I need I didn't I was trying to make a documentary without anything scary. So you Whereas know. to me, I'm like this Jersey kid visiting these cool L.A. bros, and they're telling me to put a sheet over my head <laughs> and wander into an insane, abandoned insane asylum. Like, I've seen this movie before. I know what happens. You drive away, and I get stabbed. Like, I've, I know what happens next. But that didn't happen. <laughs> but and that was our meet cute. Uh, well, then the crazy thing that happened is... And then, yeah, so yeah. Je uh, Jeff's other friend, Matt, who also made Bob... Uh, was completely randomly paired as my freshman roommate. So first day of school, we all met and basically, you know, started getting assigned random shorts to make together, and they were very bad, and we s slowly tried to make them better. Yeah. <laughs> that has sort of continued until now. Yeah. 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 What is, in terms of the learning curve, when you start working there at, uh, doing short films at NYU, is it by junior year you're feeling good, or is it not even until senior year that you really kind of think, like, I'm feeling confident as a filmmaker? I don't know that it... That There's necessarily any ever not, not burst, even of, right like now. burst of confidence, <laughs> yeah. you know. I think, yeah. and and I think the program was wonderful. It was a great school and everything. I think more important than anything was that you know we were able to find a group of people. We were kind of forced together at first. I mean, it was John who wound up editing plus one was your freshman roommate. Mm -hmm. Matt was your high school friend and my freshman roommate. We had a couple other people that we met. I think there was kind of like there was a little bit of a stereotype at NYU of. Like, they were very serious films and lots of, like, what's your thing? You say the, the clown flipping a pancake, well, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, like a black, guy, like you know? black and white. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there's a lot of very, like, serious movies, and that was kind of taken really seriously, and we wanted to make comedies, and I think we kind of found our kind of crowd of people who that seemed important to them, too. And I think more than any school or anything, finding the people who you trust and who like have your back and will show up and you know move a light stand around for you for 12 hours and then you try to do the same thing for them that was the thing that i think you know having a group of people around us was the only thing that ever really gave us much confidence yeah. you know just because having uh, it's an amazing it's a it's a horrible feeling to have a group of people around you go like oh whatever we're trying to make is not any good and it's an amazing pe feeling to have like 10 or 40 or 100 people around you going like, hey, yeah, we're all here working a 16-hour day because the stupid idea that you wrote a couple days or a couple years ago is interesting enough to us to, you know, sacrifice a day or do whatever, you know, like spend our weekend doing this together. So, yeah. you know. I feel like that's the hardest thing, whether it's, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in college or even when you get out and you're working in yeah. whatever professional career it is, especially in the entertainment industry out here, yeah. is to find that group of people that you really connect with yeah. that it's... And there are people that you will meet and you enjoy, yeah. but you can never really collaborate with them. For whatever reason, it's just sure. that we, we enjoy each other, but it's never going to take that next step. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I feel like it's so rare to find those people that you really connect with. I think that's really real. I also think there's a – sometimes I, I think there's a, a thing in which naturally filmmaking and just being a human can be so self-centered that I think it can be about, like, I have this project. I need to go find the people that are going to help me. I think there's another way to kickstart that, which is, like, people need – stuff and help on their things. I mean, I basically started any kind of career I had started. I didn't ever like set out to be a producer. It was just like, there's a lot of people at film school and out of film school that were just like, I have this idea. And I was like, I have some organizational skills. I could probably help you figure out how to like not totally waste all your money or like how to get people to this place on time. Like there wasn't any like skill or ambition I had, but it was like, you know, I think being available to people and like really offering yourself with that kind of generosity is a is I think a huge frequently missed way to get into those kind of things, you know. Well, I know I in one interview you were saying that in terms of the way you approach a project, yeah. it's uh, one has a microscopic view and one has a telescopic mm -hmm. view. Uh, other than that, though, what is something that you saw in each other that you really admired in terms of the qualities that you would bring to a project? 
I think um, one of the things that has always worked is that we're we're very good uh, as like friends, and I can be very sensitive and really reactive. I'm the kind of person that. Uh, I was just saying earlier, I ruined so many mornings for Reimer on the way to set because we would always carpool together and he'd get in the car and he's had breakfast and he's feeling good and he'd get in the car and I'm like, I'm worried about today. And he'd be like, okay. okay. <laughs> so, and that extends to life. I mean, if I'm panicking about anything, a- Andrew has always been someone that's really uh, patient and very much there for me and is never going to be that person back to me. He's not the guy that gets in the car and goes, I'm, I'm anxious about this scene today and I don't think it, and I have to calm him down. And what that allows is when it just comes to, when it comes to just the two of us, we have that dynamic. Once we get to set, then it changes, you know, and, and we can both be, uh, you know, therapists for the, the, whoever needs to, to work out a situation or conflict, um, will be those figureheads, but with each other, I think we just work as complementary personalities because I have a tendency to be a little bit dramatic and Andrew is very steady. So um, that works, that that helps as well. And I think in terms of like the, the work we do in the writing, you know, we kind of found each other early and we like working and collaborating with like so many of our different friends and it's different in every kind of iteration. But I mean, I sort of feel like early on in college, I just think jeff is really funny like when we just like sit and like eat lunch like we just laugh a lot and then (laughs) and there's also a mix of like the things that you know from really terrible like looking back now like really terrible short films we're writing there's like a mix with the stuff that jeff has always kind of gravitated towards and done really well that is like something that makes me really laugh and something that also just like kind of like does that kind of like squeeze your heart kind of thing at the same time and that's what it's like conversationally i mean we will you know mostly just sit around and talk about like the disastrous interaction you had at the gym or something right. like that. And then we'll like segue into something that's like really serious and, and interesting and, and deep. And, you know, anyway, I, I, yeah, I think we also, we have very similar, um, sensibilities and taste. Yeah. Like we yeah. generally like the same movies and same television, yeah. how much we like those things that creates the Venn diagram, <laughs> yeah. you know, like I'm, I'm sure I'll like Chernobyl, but you love Chernobyl. And that's just like, I want to talk, tell every, take a moment uh, to plug Chernobyl. I have nothing to do with the TV show, but I think everyone should be watching it. I mean, you really like, you know, the, the really human stories, like really human. And uh, I do you want to plug La La Land three years after it came out, guys? La La Land, (laughs) that movie better win Best Picture, or I'm going to be furious. Uh, But no, yeah, I think we, I think we work well together because ultimately, what can be something that cripples a lot of partnerships, which is being contrasting personalities and different people, actually becomes the thing that works best for us because. we're never in a situation where one of us is going, this is the funniest line here. No, this is the funniest line. Reimer doesn't, oftentimes doesn't even care about that. He's like, okay, you've written 10 really funny lines in the scene. I'm not sure this scene even belongs in this movie. And I'm like, you're right. Uh, when it comes down to, I guess you're driving together, your car pulled together mm-hmm. to the set, and you kind of have your, you kind of uh, have your discussions, and then you get to the set, and you kind of be those therapists for everybody mm-hmm. else. When it comes to directing, and it comes to like wanting to give a note for an actor, do you do you designate one of you to do the notes, or do you kind of split it up and we'll just whoever's feeling it? We had like a really kind of like clever. It took us a couple days on the side of this, but we come, came up with kind of like a really clever shorthand of like literally like hand signals. Mm-hmm. I don't really remember what they were right now. The thumbs up. It was like <laughs> thumbs up. So it was very very, very, hard very clever, <laughs> very difficult. Yeah, thumbs up. But it was, no, it was basically just like you know. I think, and we were trying to limit the amount to which. You know, I know it can be sensitive for actors to be like the people huddled behind the monitor, you know, talking for too long. So we would kind of just like do a take and it would just be like a simple like, do we want another one or are we good? Do we want to move on? Um, and then if there was a note, like we would kind of run it by each other and one of us would just be like, yeah, that sounds good. And then if it was my note, I'd wander over and tell them or if it was Jeff's note, he'd wander over and tell Like we weren't like both trying to compete to like finish you know have the last word on the notes or anything like that it was 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 never like like, i think she should be upset here well i think she should be angry like it never it was like we'll do one it was was an easy that was an easy thing for it It was like if there's i was like ah this doesn't feel right if it's this let's make sure we get two where it's this thing and we're like okay great we'll get two where it's that way and if and then in the edit room we'd figure out like which worked better and you know Yeah. yeah i will say one of the most humbling things about this is so often i would think i'm placating him you know as my co-director and just being like fine we'll do it that way and the number of times 
in post. And I'm like, thank God we did one that way because <laughs> now we have it, and this it's actually the best thing for. I think team. that's the humbling thing about filmmaking in general. Yeah, yeah. How like you work so hard to prep everything, and you're wrong always. Yeah, like yeah. literally always. You're always you always have it wrong. Um, yeah. And being open to other people's ideas and the whoever is you know it's usually the person that's like ah. I think you should, you know, a producer or an actor or anybody being like, guys, we've done 16 uh, in this way. You yeah. might yeah. want to consider doing one other yeah. alternative for yeah. your scene, you know. Or the person that's just like, maybe you should just get a, just a shot of this. Like, yeah. Oh, why? And why? You're no, in the I'm bay and you're oh, like, yeah. Oh, yes. oh, man. Oh, my yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We learned that lesson. <laughs> yeah, many times. <laughs> well, the uh, building up to yeah. the plus one. So, I mean, of course, the, the, the film's about Ben and Alice. They uh, are in their 20s. All their friends are getting married, which always happens. It's a common thread to a lot yeah, of people in their sure. uh, late 20s, early 30s. And uh, if you're single, that can be kind of a miserable experience, yeah. going to those mar- uh, weddings alone and alone and alone. So they decide to partner up for the various 10 weddings that they're going to be going over to, and we kind of track them over the course of the year. So as you're coming up with this idea, I assume kind of a real life experience. A lot of friends of yours were getting married, and yeah. so this is, there's story within this. Yeah, I would say the proposals were starting around the time we started writing this. So we hadn't even actually even gone to that many weddings yet. Yeah. Uh, the benefit of a really long development process is that <laughs> w- once we started going to those weddings, we experienced something really funny, like a weird speech or an emotional moment that we were witnessing two friends having. We were like that's going in the movie, and so the movie really, ev- script really evolved over the process of us getting to go to uh, weddings together and also separately and, and seeing our friends get married. But you know, I remember when we were writing this, we had only been to one really important friend wedding like the yep. kickoff wedding which actually is uh the first wedding in the movie oh, is based nice. on it and then yeah. from there we you know we were just really picking and choosing from different weddings we were going to and adding it to the movie yeah. is every uh wedding that we dive into in the course of this film based on a little bit of something from a wedding you've been to pretty much yeah yeah it's i mean close, or some but... <clears throat> yeah i mean some experience we've had or some you know yes in general yeah they, in general in general well. yes i think there was an element of it where when you're looking at it from just an outline perspective, you're like, we've got a beach wedding, we've got a rooftop wedding, we've got a hot wedding, we've got a this wedding. That was, you know, really chosen out of just wanting a, a diversity of location and vibe and tone. From within that, then we'd be like, this kind of actually reminds me of this person's wedding. It might not have been a rooftop, but it was an outdoor patio and it had this feel of casual. It's just casual and wear whatever you want. So let's make it like that one. Yeah. And we were also constantly developing, like the part of the script process was developing the weddings as a factor that really affects our two main characters. That as they, you know, they start out, they agree to this, and all the first weddings are horrible and they start to get better and that kind of sort of starts to help them see each other in a different light and and that's sort of you know we really liked the idea that the uh which is something that we feel is like the environment like it, you're gonna feel differently about your weekend and your experience at a wedding where it was 100 degrees outside and you know the best man got drunk and like you know <laughs> admonished everybody then you will at like this amazing hawaiian wedding where the wedding is perfect the weather's perfect and everyone's having an amazing time and everything was you know incredible so yeah yeah so as this is kind of starting to happen the proposals are happening in your life yeah. at, what is the deciding factor for you guys to think like there is not just a, a short, but perhaps a full feature that we could do out of this? I think the thing, you know, the the skeleton of the movie, the, the general kind of two sentence pitch maybe of a movie about people who go to weddings together was something that kind of sounded like a movie to us. P- potentially, we we're very self-aware that it sounded like a movie that had been made a lot of times. It sounded <laughs> like a lot of romantic comedies. I think the thing that actually kept us chasing it and kept us like not tossing it aside like anyone does any number of movie ideas was that we felt like what we could add or what we were really trying to do was tell a relationship story that felt like or in the spirit of some of the ways the people that we know kind of do get in and out of relationships. Um, I think that, uh, you know, romantic comedies are wonderful. There are great examples of them, but there's plenty of them that don't really look like the way our friends or us like get into and out of a relationship. I think we were talking about emotionally, you know, loneliness and um, uh, kind of convenience can cause a relationship and be a catalyst for two people getting together just as much as seeing someone in a bookstore and having this like brilliant meet cute moment, you know, and we weren't looking at that pessimistically. It was just sort of like, yeah, people don't always get together in the way, like sometimes it's just your friend and sometimes that's messy and that's, you know, um, yeah, I think we really wanted to portray um, not just flawed characters, but a flawed 
relationship, you know, yeah. and, and how it flaws in the way it begins and flaws and throughout the whole process of it. I, I think there's a tendency with romantic comedy, something that really bothers me about them is that it's a given that they're right for each other. Mm -hmm. And right. it's not their fault that it's not working out. It's the world's fault. You know, right. something's getting in between. It's their family. It's their family. The, crappy ex-boyfriend yeah. that shows it's up. their and, job. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, so, and there are some rom-coms that I really love that I also think have say some really dangerous things about love that like, it amazes me how many romantic comedies where the characters don't even talk to each other for <laughs> most of the movie it's just a given that they should be together right. and but they can't get to each other and then they do and it feels so great and there's a, a time and a place for that but i think for us we really wanted to from the very first scene establish these two people are friends like we're not going to see them collide into each mm -hmm. other's lives we, we they have already they are already friends that dynamic is there so where do you go from there and you know, spoiler, like they get, they do get together, but it happens at a point in the movie. You said spoiler so fast. Nobody yeah. had time to turn this <laughs> yeah. off. If they spoiler, wanted the other. <laughs> That's like the way I spoil things. Spoiler, they get together. I always tell you spoiler and then I say it immediately and you always, you just did it. I yeah, just I wanted, did it. Yeah, yeah. Spoiler. Wow. All spoiler, right. they end up together. All right. uh, so they, they do get together, but it happens halfway through the movie. And what we really enjoyed doing was like, well, now what? You know, mm -hmm. and how do you, that, how does this buddy movie now turn into a relationship, almost a dramedy, you yeah. know, where you're kind of living in their relationship and watching the angst that can sometimes come with that, especially hooking up with and getting together with your best friend. That's not going to, for someone like the character of Ben, who has had issues with locking in exactly what it is that he's looking for and having really high expectations if he falls into a, a casual relationship with someone there's going to be a, lo a lot of uh of reverberation of those actions after the fact of maybe he didn't process it at first and then suddenly he's not thinking about it and that snowballs this has happened to me before yeah. where something can happen naturally or casually and then now i do all this like Yes, work later. Like, wait, wait a minute. Is this the right thing to do? I don't want to hurt her. Do I end it now so I don't hurt her down the line? Mm -hmm. I need to figure this. I have to do all this math. And then that suddenly you're not being you anymore in the relationship. And those are the things we really wanted to show that we felt like a lot of rom-coms didn't really get deep into. Well, the one thing I liked about it is Ben's speech at the end of the film, mm -hmm. where he's saying if you're always looking for perfection, you're going to miss something incredible that could be right in front of you. Yeah. And I feel like that true for relationships, but also just anything in life. Sure. So for something yeah. like for this film, mm -hmm. it's like, well, you know, gosh, we've heard a lot of sitcom uh, or rom-com pitches before. Sure. But it's like if you're always questing for like the, the perfect, like, oh, nobody's ever told this yeah. thing. Yeah. Then you can miss a great opportunity to tell the story that you really care about. Yeah. yeah. I think fear can ruin a lot of potential, you know, for creation, whether it's a relationship or a movie or anything. If you're scared of what might happen if you mess it up then and you don't do anything at all, you'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's what certainly spoke to me because I am, I can talk myself out of anything yeah. so easily. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, uh, no, who would want to watch me doing this stupid thing? Right, right. And then you just talk, and you toss yeah, it away. Yeah, yeah. And so it yeah. was that really, that whole uh, speech then really reverberated with me, right. just uh, just not in a relationship, but just in a personal level. So that yeah. was a great part of the, the film. Spoiler, there's a speech at the end. Yeah, spoiler, guys. Oh, spoiler. Oh, I should have said now spoiler alert. <laughs> so the, the process of making this film, though, because you had written the film and you were in the process of uh, getting ready to go into production. And then the backer, the original backer that you had, mm -hmm. pulled out the last minute because he was going to go uh, throw some money behind the Trump presidential campaign. He did. And he did, and in worked. fact. And it yes, worked. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we know that Trump is president now. But sure. at the moment, I mean, at, back then, it seemed like, okay, sure, this guy's going to become president. When he does pull out and says, you know, I'm going to go do this, were you like, what? what? He didn't. Okay, so it, there is. So we didn't have nearly that much perspective. Uh, <laughs> we were also, it is sort of very funny for a solid, I don't know, year or six months. Like, it was a good day when we got an email from Anthony Scaramucci or his team. Like, well, not directly from him, but his team and company were involving, you know, the uh, the financing of our movie. And then all of a sudden that, you know, uh, essentially we didn't know really the what the situation was. We just knew that the company, like, completely fell apart and they were backing out. Right, we didn't get a memo saying, saying he's like, pulled out to finance Trump's okay. campaign. He pulled out, that sucked. You know, you think it's you. You're like, what do we do wrong? Mm -hmm. And then the article hits a month and a half later. That's in the New York Times that said yeah. Anthony Scaramucci to finance Trump's camp campaign. Not entirely, but you know, help. well, it was yeah, yeah to help. Yeah, <laughs> going for that communications director <laughs> yeah. job. Oh man, we did realize um, at one point we did sort of the math of realizing if we had um, if it had come out, we would have been 
like within a week of trying to take the movie to market with his uh, his eight day uh, wow. part at piece as uh, <laughs> uh, communication yes. director. So that yeah. would have been a whole different trajectory. <laughs> Uh, so that falls through, and then uh, as reading through the the history of it, just that you're having that one meeting, trying to see if that funding is going to come through, and it ends up being a pass initially. Yeah, I mean, we had we yeah we did we we really tried our producers who were you know incredibly loyal and tenacious for years and did wind up you know wonderfully getting the the movie made. Uh, but yeah, they were trying everything. We we lost this. Uh, funding. It wasn't all of the funding. We still had a little bit. Uh, no, we still had some of the, you know, of of the, of the money there. But he was kind of the majority investor at that point. And they, yeah, they really tried every kind of what if we pulled it from here and brought these, you know, all that. And um, it was it was right over the holidays. It was it was bad. It felt bad. It was we were pretty depressed for a solid I don't know year, year or so. <laughs> A year. Um, I can understand that. But, uh, yeah, those, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was a, a really important lesson in, in, I think, the kind of grieving process of, you know, being in denial, not giving that up, you know, being all th- th- all stages of bar. I don't actually know the stages of grief uh, <laughs> now that I realize this. That's right. But there was a, so I, I can grab a couple of them. We did. We were trying to bargain. We were in denial. And stage four is make a short. There's an film. anger is That's one right. of them. Yeah, yeah. But one of the stages was uh, yeah, but be be defined and make a short film. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah. Uh, I've lost track of where, what, what the question was. But. Uh, so, because uh, I know when the funding pulls out, and a, a project that you were both very passionate yeah. about, yeah, uh, and it tried, and as well as the producing partners and stuff that you're working with, trying to make this happen, but it comes to a point where they're saying, "Guys, maybe we just gotta let this, we gotta let this go." Yeah, I mean, we uh, kudos to the people who told us that because it wasn't like this movie's never going to happen. I think they knew that if we just kept going into every single meeting we had talking about this movie, that it would cause us to to just not gain any ground in the rest of our lives and our careers so they urged us to create new stuff and so we wrote a couple spec scripts and we made these two short films uh pregame and post party and those shorts are exactly what got us a meeting with studio 71 who would go on to finance the film which you you, but you would never we could never have seen it like that it Mm -hmm. was not like make a short film that's how you'll get the money it was just like let it go and really put everything you've got, that passion, into new new projects. Yeah, I can't remember who it was, but I remember somebody saying to us, because at that point it would have been like three years into trying yeah. to make this movie, and somebody saying like, you know, it's been about three years, you probably, if this is what you want to do, you probably should have done something else as well <laughs> yeah, yeah. by now. Yeah. You know, like, you probably should have something else that you're trying to push forward yeah. or you're trying to make. And we are like, okay, yeah. I guess we will go come up with some other ideas. Yeah. Uh, we will, you know... Yeah. Uh, you well, know. what was it like though uh, when they say, "Hey, maybe do a couple short films to just get together with friends and people that you've known and just like, hey, we're gonna get together and just do this fun short for a weekend." Was it just a nice way to kind of just recharge yourself after going through this three years of trying to get this film initially off the ground? It was more, you know, it was a thing of just really the the shorts that we made were we were just sort of approaching as an exercise. It wasn't necessarily some sort of thing we were planning to do for our careers. It was we were really in the middle of, I mean. Jeff uh, has directed commercials really since we graduated college and done a ton of them. I've done a lot of producing of them. We had a we were in our sort of year of in the in the woods uh, of uh, trying to figure out what to do next after this. We were making uh, some commercials that were really cool. They were set up on a Thursday and Friday and a Monday um, with this one company that Jeff helped found the bindery that ended up producing uh, or that produced plus one with us. Um, and that we, we've worked with for years and are really great. Um, and we basically, I, I walked into a movie theater like two days before we were going to shoot. We were watch, we were about to watch, uh, the new Ghostbusters movie at the Vista <laughs> and we had two commercials straddling a weekend and we were two days away from filming and I was pretty stressed out about it. And Reimer came in and sat down next to me and said, I don't want to stress you out more, <laughs> but what if we use the gear while we have it on the weekend and make a short film? And I was like, that's, we'd have to write that in two days. And he was like, yeah. Yeah. And we called, we called, we called our friend Greg Beecham, who's a producer on Plus One and it runs the the binder. And I was like, 
hey, I think we uh, we have this idea for a short film. What do you think? He's like, yeah, absolutely. Just yeah. go go make the movie. And so we and so yeah. we made we wrote in a day a movie, a short film called Pregame. We got all of our friends together to rehearse it. Uh, in fairness, next... it got a lot better in rehearsals because. Oh yeah, yeah. well I mean, if you write a short film in a day, <laughs> you can't. It's not exactly going to be freaking. But yeah, so we we brought all of our friends in who are all in plus one, every single one of them, and and actually Maya plays uh, a. a alternate universe version of herself in Plus One. She plays a character named Alicia who's not over her ex, Nate, and is getting really drunk. And this was our way of getting to live out some of the Plus One dream. So we knew she could play the part well and she crushed it. Uh, and it's crazy because we could never have guessed she would go on to play Alice uh, two years At that later. Point, yeah. yeah. So um, It was also, the, the sort of even the mechanics of that movie were, were funny. I mean, it, when we, we put it out and it got a little bit of buzz... It was very much around the fact that it's a oneer, but that really came out of like after I stressed Jeff out with saying like I think we should make a short. He was like, "Well, the only the only way we can do this is if we do like a oneer or something because like this is the Saturday between two shoot days. We don't have a crew. We're just gonna have to ask our friends who are working on this com- these commercials with us do this for free. So we can't do like a forty setup, you know, short film yeah. day. We can do one take and we'll use." Uh, camera operator and AC. We'll have somebody run lights beforehand, and then we'll just leave them like this. Yeah. We'll just be that and we'll the sound guy. And we, we like, shot the entire short film in three and a half hours. Yeah, yeah. 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 One shot. Once we got it, we were, we were done. Yeah. That's yeah. how many takes did you do? Um, I think we did like eleven full takes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, and, and what I like about uh, Plus One is uh, that at the beginning of the first initial wedding reception, there is the uh, the sequence there that is very, uh, I really like the continuous take for that. And it's always fun when you get that. Yeah. When well, you're like, oh, all right, very nice. Funny thing about that continuous take is that it, it the uh, original uh, version of it is twice as long. And we did a six and a half minute one or uh, to open the movie. We were a little big for our British. We were so <laughs> stoked uh, to, to do to reinvent the rom com visually. And uh, we started test screening it for audiences. And it was very clear right away that something was really wrong with our opening. And uh, it, it took us a while to get to Everyone the point. Everyone hated where, the opening. And it was, no, it didn't hate it, but it was yeah. the scoring really low. Well, because here's, the, the, here's the, the thing it's like, editing is really important especially mm-hmm. with a comedy you you just pace is so critical to keeping the blood flow going and keeping your audience engaged especially in your first act which is you know commonly your first act is going to be the hardest because you're not in the thick of it yet you're you're establishing you're you're doing exposition you're doing all these things and so you're not in love with the characters yet you're still figuring out what their deal is and Alice Maya's character is so drunk that you're just sitting in this wonder for six and a half minutes with her just like ruining this guy Ben's night <laughs> over and over and over again, and you're not really learning that much. There of really this is stuff three about... more minutes of yeah. them running around, of her like chasing him around a wedding. Yeah. There's so much more choreography and so much. And we There's were a hundred like, extras. Yeah, it was, we were yeah. like, all right, well, we need to cut this in half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we did. And I remember people were so nervous to say it you know yeah, I could yeah. see it in people's eyes like i could see them wanting to say i think you need to cut up the oneer but no one wanted to say it because we spent so much time on that thing and uh and finally we were just like i think we need to cut up the oneer and people were like yes <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saying yes i so i so wanted to say that to you guys yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what I liked is that uh, Beck Bennett sure. uh, plays the, uh, the the friend that's getting married in that. Uh, but then there's also some great little people that pop up along the way that, that I've known from uh, doing improv. Hmm. So like David Tooney, who's one of the wedding oh, photographers, God, Betsy Sedaro, does oh, one of the speeches. I yeah. uh, love both of them. So uh, I know during the casting process, you kind of had uh, different color schemes for in terms mm-hmm. of how you were approaching uh, – people that would be playing these roles. So you had like green, we know these people. Yeah. Yellow, oh, we might you know, kind of, and then red, we don't know who these people are. Uh, how did, break down how the casting process went and, and where, where are Dave and, and Betsy kind of fall on this? Uh, well, we had a great casting uh, director team of, of Neely Eisenstein and Lindsay Weissmuller. And, uh, you know, we'd been, they, we'd been working with them all along the entire process of making this movie. Um, we had so many speaking roles, so some of it was we just knew so many actors that we really liked working with. Um, I mean, David Tooney and, and Betsy are people that we've worked with in like kind of more tangential ways along the way. I, I've produced things that other fr- friends of mine from school or from just life have made and spent two or three days with them on a set here or there. And just they're just kind of the people that like, I don't even know. I, I kind of have a feeling like when like an offer for the movie came through, they were kind of like, 
What? Who? What is it? Who? <laughs> uh, I, they would probably be nice and say something like that. But like it was from from like we'd I'd seen them in shows. I'd seen them. I'd been a crew member on a set where I watched them just be hilarious and be great. And so um, I think with the speed with which we were trying to put the movie together in, in pre production and also just. Um, really trying to find a lot of people that we knew, you know, the way we were, we knew we were shooting was we were kind of moving through things kind of quickly. And we really just wanted to make sure that we had people that we could bring in. A lot of the roles don't have like five days of shooting. They're like four hours or, you know, and we needed people that could come in, knock it out of the park and be, and, and basically, I mean, that would be their bit in the movie. And, you know, uh, and so, yeah, uh, the two of them specifically, are people we just known tangentially through people or through work. Uh, and we're, it was so funny. Like, you know, we were just sort of whenever, like we would hear like someone like that say, yes, it would be like the best. Like, in, you know, we'd get like, we'd be in prep and busy figuring out the production design or something. And then a producer would pop their head in a, in like a, an office and be like, Oh, we just got bets. Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but then you also have, uh, Ed Begley Jr. Sure. Uh, what was it like getting to approach Ed Begley Jr. and getting him to agree to be in the film? It was fantastic. I mean, that's there is. I recognize we had some major advantages in having Red Hour as producers. There's a tremendous amount of legitimacy to our operation, um, given their kind of involvement. And so when we have people like Debbie Liebling, and and Nikki Weinstock and Jackie Cohn kind of calling on our behalf to say, "Hey, you should read this script," or you, it really gets someone to take something a little bit more seriously, which is great. But I also like when we, we had dinner with Ed Bagley Jr. and he was the, he's the nicest man <laughs> on planet Earth. I mean, it was just yeah. it was great. It was yeah. you know, yeah, he's the best. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there are there are so many roles to fill. Uh, there's just so many moments to be excited and surprised yeah. by someone saying yes to us. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I do remember Ed Begley being on that short list of people we wanted and, and making the offer and just crossing your fingers and getting the phone call that he's in. It was just yeah. the best. Yeah. You know, I can't picture anyone else doing that role now. Uh, so now we've got, of course, the film revolves around, as I mentioned before, Ben and Atlas yep. and their adventure during the year together. And so you cast Maya because yeah, you've known her previously. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jack, is that somebody that you'd worked with before? Or was that kind of just we're reaching out to somebody that we think might be good. He's not someone we've ever worked with before. He's uh, he, but he did go to NYU. He graduated four years after we did. So I'd actually met him at a party at NYU, and I'd known of him. And uh, we were on the hunt for a, a Ben for a long time. And the thing we always knew about this part, not of the role of Ben, not just from ourselves, but because plenty of people told us. <laughs> Which is that he was a frustrating character. You know, people would read the script and be like, this Ben guy is really tough. Which is, as we said, we wanted. We wanted to create flawed characters and a a person that really looked like and seemed like a lot of our friends or ourselves. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to make sure that whoever played Ben had an innate uh, likability to him and a a sympathetic quality to him. And when you meet Jack Quaid, he's truly the the kindest person. The only person kinder is Ed Begley Jr. But yeah, (laughs) watching the two of them talk, it's like two sons, like just exploding into each other. Uh, But they, they, yeah, Jack is just like, we had a Skype conversation with him and he immediately, I was just like, this is, this is that quality that we're looking for. He's the most generous guy, not just uh, as, as a person, but as an actor. And the thing that could be really challenging about this movie is that when you read it, you can see Alice is the character that like flies off the page comedically. She's physical, she's funny, she's vulgar. And Ben is a little bit more of your straight man who also has this like debilitating problem of of wanting perfection. So I told one of the things I told Jack when we first met with him was I was like, I look at Ben as like the fall guy of this movie. Is that something you're prepared to do? And he was like, a hundred percent. I want to make sure that you know, I can bring as much as I can to this, but I, I'm not going to try to take the spotlight from Maya or the character of Alice at all. And we're like, that's amazing. And, and then once we got into rehearsals, yeah, it was really clear that this was a person that just wanted to make the best possible movie and never try to, like, if she's getting laughs on set, come up with a funky improv and maybe I'll get a laugh. Like, it was never that. He was just a sounding board for her to to bounce off of and and that created really interesting and fun chemistry well what i liked about both of them is that they're both characters that uh whether comedically or straight they do have uh tendencies that could be grading uh, sure. about themselves oh, but yeah. finding the, the those right actors that can bring 
that can still play that, but also bring that humanity to it too. So you're not like, I hate this person. I do not care about them. Yeah. Uh, and, and what happens to them during the course of the story? But yeah. you find those actors that can really say like, yeah, I mean, they may have their flaws, but I can also root for them. Yeah. Yeah. I have to shout out Maya Erskine as well. I mean, she, same thing where Jack is able to bring sympathy to everything. Maya is able to add this like humanity to everything. She's, as a friend, the funniest cursor I've ever met. Like she curses yeah. in a way that is so it's it doesn't never feels like forced or like wouldn't it be funny if I said uh, a curse word here? It's it's like it's so organic to her, but coming out of this like tiny goblin person, it's always so <laughs> funny. So yeah, it's that that organic uh those organic personality traits of being able to do things without feeling like it's it's Effortful is was really important to us. Yeah. Uh, given the delay, the long production process to bring this film to life, had the film been, uh, you're able to do the film when uh, Scaramucci was going to be funding it and it went sure. there. What, how do you think the film would have been? Would it have been a different film than if you made it then as opposed to making it now? Absolutely. And I think it would have been different if for no other reason than, you know, I think Jeff and I were in different places. I think we were, we probably, we don't know, but we probably would have been different filmmakers. I mean, I would absolutely have loved to have gotten to make that movie. I think, I don't necessarily know that I can say that like categorically any version of this along the way would have been the best, the worst, any of those kind of things. I'm incredibly happy with what we wound up with. That's wonderful. I mean, I, you know, I hope it doesn't always take, uh, you know. <laughs> that would be nice. You, you know, this, uh, you know, nice. half a decade to get any project off the ground, but I'm also kind of prepared for that uh, to happen. Um, but no, I mean, I think that would have been, uh, you know, the I look back on that and like a lot of the team was the same. A lot of the, t some of the team was different. That would have been an amazing experience to make that. I mean, now, yeah, the Scaramucci factor would have been a problem, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, in retrospect. But that was, you know, uh, that was a genuinely heartbreaking thing to have to kind of dissolve that team um, at that time. Uh, yeah. But also, I, you know, I think it's a pretty human thing to hope that we're constantly evolving and growing and so uh you know the way we we certainly feel like we've gotten hopefully better over those couple of years uh so i like to hope that we were able to bring more to it just by having more time and having to fail and reconsider things and and do that kind of thing so yeah so, guys, it would have been so much worse. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it would have sucked. Yeah, that's, uh, for, so you went to the Tribeca Film Festival, mm -hmm. and you win the Audience Award for Best Narrative Film. What was the experience like going to the Tribeca Film Festival? I mean, being going to school in New York, so yeah. you're around that, but actually getting to show it, something. It there. was amazing. Yeah, it was wild. It was incredible. Yeah, I mean, we're. it was like the greatest homecoming party ever in that we went to NYU together. I grew up in New Jersey, so like my entire extended family got to come out for it. My high school friends were there. The entire crew of Bob was there. Uh, all the Bob <laughs> key players were there. Uh, uh, you know, all of our friends who live out here now, we went to NYU with, all flew in for it. Our college professor was there, the guy that brought us all together. We call him Dumbledore. His name's Rick Livvin. He came out and all eight friends who met in his class and still work together today were at the screening, so we all saw him. We got to go speak to his class, the class we all met. It's just like, it was unbelievably emotional every single day. Uh, I either cried or wanted to cry. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And it's one thing to show, but then all of a sudden get the recognition of the, the, the audience award. Yeah. But that, I, that was awesome. I mean, it was, you know, I think just, I still don't know if I've fully processed it. I mean, the experience of getting to, after working on this for as long as we did, to just get to... Uh, walk into a theater with a room of people that some of which we knew and a lot of which we didn't and to get to show something that we worked really hard on and that generally people seem to enjoy and get something out of is uh i don't it's a, a wonderful experience award or no award like just the feeling of like walking into a room and getting to see that is um amazing you know it felt like this is a weird analogy I've never made. It felt like Avengers of fin Infinity War, which is so fun because you're getting to see these characters. <laughs> you and the Avengers. I love it. Well, you've got the shirt. Okay, there so. you go. But you like go. the fun thing of Avengers Infinity War is when you get to see all these characters finally meet each other and mm -hmm. you get to watch them, them bounce off of each other. That's which Avenger would I be? <sighs> you're Ant-Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. You're Ant-Man. I'll take that. I've never, uh, I haven't seen it, but you know. Yeah, sure. well, it's, I know. Uh, no, uh, you're Ant-Man. Uh, so uh, it was just getting to see all these people from our lives meet each other for the first time at the premiere. Like it was, you know, high school friend meeting college friend and 
you know, person who worked on the movie getting to meet my family. Like everyone was meeting each other and it was just the best. It was wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a film that you want to make uh, for yourself. So you have to be passionate about it. Yeah. It's a long part of your life. You're dedicating to doing this. Yeah. But it's got to be a great feeling that what you've made resonates with so many other people. Yeah, it's it, it really is uh, an incredible feeling that is like still uh, it it hasn't fully sunk yeah. into me. Yeah. Uh, I think that that people um, I do think that there's a natural I think we've been so much in an experience of like this has been within a relatively small circle of people between producers and and test audiences and stuff that we've been trying to make and this being our first time actually taking it out and into a wider world and seeing like if like we you know we've i think we've told ourselves for years like yeah everyone has this thing right where all your friends get married and you're kind of like wait did i miss something you know and for people to actually connect with parts of this movie is uh, it's incredible yeah yeah so we've got the film coming out here on June 14th. Yep. Uh, and as always, the, the next projects that you, you're you working on, is there anything that you can share? Um, can we share? I don't I you're, think so. You're wrapping up a... a oh, a, yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm working on a, uh, a a branching narrative series called Epic Night with a company called Echo. Uh, actually, my girlfriend Scarlett wrote it. I got to direct it. A whole bunch of our friends, a bunch of the uh, Plus One crew uh, were on the production team. So that's been really fun. That'll be out in the fall. Uh, and then we're working on another movie script. Uh, we're working on a couple TV projects. Yeah, we're sort uh, of on the verge of being able to make some official proclamations, yeah. but um, you never know. We've as learned we've, a lesson as we've experienced. Yes. <laughs> so we really want to play it safe. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I am hoping that one of those is going to be a feature-length take on Bob. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that's the funny what thing comes is, out of this. So if a short film Bob is 18 minutes long, a feature length Bob is like four and a half It hours. is like a weird form of torture is like what, you know. Well, yeah. your torture is my joy. It is your joy, that's true. And that's the kind of filmmaking I want to be making. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my guests today have been Jeff Chan and Andrew Reimer. Check out Plus One when it comes out in theaters, digitally and on demand, June 14th. It is going to be well worth your time. It's a great film. Uh, I'm Frank Moran. Uh, before I send my uh, my social media handles, if they want to keep track of what you guys are working on, whether it's yourselves individually, plus one, anything together, where's the best place to find you? Um, so our movie's uh, handle is at plus one movie on Instagram. Uh, so you can find us there. I'm at the real Jeff Chan on Instagram. I'm at it's rhyme time. That's right. All right, look at that. Oh, I'm uh, I'm at Happy Go Jackie. Oh, not as cool all right. as that. Not as cool as Rhyme Time. That's oh, yeah, well, that's why it's Rhyme Time. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us for this episode of I Talk Movies. Make sure you check out Plus One when it comes out in theaters on demand and digitally on June 14th. We'll see you next time on an all-new episode right here on Popcorn Talk. From producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.